Welcome to Thinking West. We're going to be talking all about Christianity, education, and culture, and where these things intersect. And we're also throwing in some uh, reflections on classic literature as we are today. I'm Christian. Uh, welcome to the channel. And today we're talking all about John Bunyan's classic work called The Pilgrim's Progress, known as one of the greatest novels of all time and second in terms of a modern novel uh, in chronology behind Cervantes' Don Quixote. Now, John Bunyan was a, a prominent Puritan writer of the late 1600s, this being his, uh, by far his most famous work. And we're going to be diving into 10 ways, or, or 10 takeaways, uh, from the work and what you should really walk away from after reading it. It is a quite difficult read, as it's uh, got some more old English language in there. And even uh, many editions don't have proper punctuation or spelling of words. So it can be a little bit of a slow read, but it is a very interesting read and I highly recommend it. It's uh, one of the first books on my personal journey to read more classical literature. Um, after that, it's, it's Gulliver's Travels, which I'll talk about later in future episodes. But today it's all about Bunyan and some of the takeaways. And we can, we'll do a couple videos on Bunyan and, and some things to learn from the Pilgrim's Progress. But coming up, 10 ways, or 10 takeaways again, uh, from the Pilgrim's Progress. First, I'll set up the story a little bit. It's about a pilgrim named Christian. So I have much affinity already with the story as I share his first name. It's about his journey toward heaven and some of the, th some of the challenges and some of the friends he meets along the way. And it's all about his pilgrimage to heaven. So Christian is met by evangelist who tells him the gospel essentially and that puts him on his path, a very long and winding journey toward uh, the heaven which they call the, the uh, celestial city. So that's the background. Now the first takeaway is that the way is exceedingly narrow. So Christian uh, passes, in many instances this is exemplified, but one of the primary ways it was uh, explicitly talked about was in uh, a place called the Valley of the Shadow Death, which of course is directly from the Bible, but in the story it's a physical place along the path toward heaven or the celestial city that Christian walks through. And here's, here's just a, one quote from the book uh, about this passage. It says that the pathway was here exceedingly narrow. When he sought in the dark to shun the ditch on the one hand, he was ready to tip over into the mire on the other. So this is a very narrow and dangerous path. The way was actually quite dark for most of the path. And on either side, he could hear the, the gnashing of teeth and some of those other biblical imagery that we hear about um, uh, in parts like Revelations. So that's one of the, the instances where Bunyan is, is telling us that, hey, the Christian path toward heaven is quite narrow. You know, not everyone's going to make it. So later on in the story, uh, Christian and one of his uh, friends along the way pass by a character called Damas. And Damas tempts them to leave the path with wealth through what, it, uh, what he's standing over, which is a silver mine. And this is just one of, another temptation. And, it's, and in this part, they describe all the bodies that were around the silver mine and the, de the deadly dangers that uh, laid in wait for them as soon as they left the path. This is another example where even, even just leaving the path by a little bit uh, led to death and destruction. Now, the, the temptation to leave this narrow path is there throughout the story. And one of the places it's also exemplified very clearly is when Christian and his friend called Hopeful um, are led astray to be captured by a giant called Despair in a castle called Doubting Castle. What they thought was a detour led to, uh, of course, uh, some very difficult troubles, which they were fortunate to be recovered from. Again, leaving the path in the story leads to dire consequences. And another instance where this occurs is that a character called Flatter leads them off the path ever so slightly, in fact, they could barely notice, um, who catches them in a net. So this is another case where leaving the path is a trap from which they were saved, uh, fortunately, by evangelist. The second takeaway is that good company goes a very long way. So uh, Christian's friendship with uh, two people individual are exemplified uh, very prominently. One is Faithful, who is martyred 
halfway through the journey, so he has a straight ticket to heaven. But then there's also another friend called Hopeful, which he picks up along the way and ends up completing the journey with him. But without some of these friendships, it's very clear throughout the story that Christian might not have made it uh, by himself. Now in part two of the Pilgrim's Progress, the story centers not around Christian, because he's already made to heaven, but around Christian's wife, who he left behind, and his family, um, and her name is Christiana. Now Christiana really exemplifies this point that uh, company or fellowship or community is very important for the Christian life, as in uh, Christiana has friendships with several characters, uh, namely Mercy, her, which is, ends up being one of her best uh, friends throughout the journey, a heroic character called Great Heart, and then many others like Ve uh, like uh, Honest, Valiant for Truth, Feeble Mind, Ready to Halt, Mr. Despondency, and his daughter, Much Afraid, and Standfast. You'll notice they all have some kind of whimsical names, but they all kind of describe who that person is or what quality that person represents. Now there are many other examples of the friends that they, they meet along the way. They're the shepherds after the enchanted grounds that point them in the right direction uh, toward the celestial city. There's the family at a house called Beautiful, which they physically arm Christian with armor and, and weaponry and all sorts of things to help him on his journey, but they also help uh, Christiana and Mercy as well. Then there's the interpreter who basically interprets what, what's really the scripture and tells them the stories of of uh, in the Bible to help them along their way. Of course, there's Evangelist, who is Jesus here, and along with some other, a uh, little bit more minor characters along the way, but all of these people are helping them, Christiana and Christian, uh, and the others in, the, in their mutual journey toward the celestial city. Now, the flip side of this, which is number three in my takeaway list here, is that bad company will conversely drag you down. This is exemplified by a few characters who uh, Bunyan warns you about along the way. You kind of understand uh, what they're all about just from their names. Um, one is called Talkative. He's a man of talk, but not the walk. He is a man who talks of religion only, but does no action to follow it up. Then there's also the man called Bayens, who wears his religion whenever it is advantageous. And one of the quotes that exemplifies this is, uh, reads as following. We are always most zealous when religion goes in his silver slippers. So when it's advantageous to put on religion, Bayans would do so, and when it's not, he would take it off like silver slippers. Then there's also the character called Ignorance, who, though he made it all the way to the gates of the Celestial City, did not fully accept or understand um, the saving power of, of Jesus Christ's resurrection, and thus uh, he did not thus get the reward of actually entering the celestial city. And uh, at one point, Christian and, and his friend, uh, Hopeful, I believe at the time, actually met him along the way, but knowing that he would uh, hinder them in their journey, had to leave him behind. Although they were going the same direction, he was slowing them down, and ultimately it was, it was the right thing to do. And fourth, one of the fourth takeaways is that trials and troubles are natural. So along our journey, we're of course going to face pitfalls and other things that hinder us in our, in our ability to believe better or practice our faith better. And this is mostly exemplified in the book by the Valley of the Shadow of Death, which I've already mentioned, but here are just a few uh, quotations from the book that really drive home this point. One is that the pathway was here so dark that oft times when he lift up his foot to go forward, he knew not where nor upon what he should set it next. So the way is so difficult and at some points in your journey you're not going to know where to go next. This is of course where, where faith comes in in knowing where to go next, but it, it's still a difficult part uh, for every Christian. The second quote is, is, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear none ill for thou art with me. Of course, this is directly from Psalms, um, so I need not say much here. Bunyan did this a lot, where he actually incorporated scripture directly into the, the narrative. And in fact, the whole book is really a running list of citations toward various parts of the Bible. The third quote is, the way was all along set so full of snares, traps, gins, and nets here, and so full of pits, pitfalls, deep holes, and shelvings, very colorful language here, a lot of descriptions. That had it now been dark, as it was when he came the first part of the way, had he had a thousand souls, they had in reason been cast away. What he's saying here is that even if, if, if the way was dark enough, and God hadn't 
opened up the clouds essentially at this part in his journey to let him see where he's going, that had he had a thousand tries or attempts, he would still never have made it through. And of course, we may feel like that at many times as well. Some of the other trials and troubles that Christian and Christiana both meet are, are the hill difficulty. It's literally called difficulty, um, so there's, there's no secrets there. And then there's some lions afterward that they had to overcome and bravely pass through um, with the help of, of Braveheart in, in the case of Christiana. There was a literal trial um, at Vanity Fair, which is a city that, which is uh, full of vanity, as, it's, as it sounds like, um, with Christian and Faithful. And, this is, and, and the result of this trial is that Faithful dies a martyr and he's found guilty uh, in, in this evil town that they pass through. Then there is, in the beginning uh, of both of the journeys, there's the slough of despond. It's just that initial uh, feeling of despondence or, or despair that every Christian must overcome in, in making it to heaven and finding the fullness of the faith. And then there, throughout the story, uh, most of the bad guys, most of the people who pose a physical threat to Christian and Christiana and their friends are giants of some kind. One, as I mentioned, was uh, giant despair. But there were also other giants throughout um, who they had to defeat in various cases or at least pass on. The fifth takeaway is that every pilgrim's path is unique. So although all of them end at the Celestial City, if they so make it, um, they all must also begin at the Wicked Gate, which I interpret as some, some, some allusion to baptism. is where many, most Christians' journeys begin. Um, but all are different in between those two points, uh, regardless. They all enter through the Wicked Gate, and they all are going toward the same place, the Celestial City, but every person's path is different. So trying to compare people's paths is not always uh, meaningful, in our own lives especially, so we're all at different points on that journey toward heaven. And you can really see this in uh, Christian and Christianas, and if you compare their journeys, although they took physically essentially the same path, starting from the same city, going through the Wicked Gate to the Celestial City, they all had very different adventures and met very different characters along the way, they had help from different places. So all in all, even though you might uh, start off from the same circumstances, your journey toward heaven and Christianity in general can be very different. In fact, it will be very different. I'd be surprised if they were similar. So the sixth takeaway in the Pilgrim's Progress is that saints inspire other pilgrims. Again, I can, I'm pulling directly from some of the passages in the Pilgrim's Progress um, to tell this point. And one of those I'll, I'll read here. And thou dost for thy friends as my good Christian did for me when he left me. He mourned that I would not heed nor regard him, but his Lord and ours did gather up his tears and put them into his bottle. And now both I and thou and these my sweet babes are reaping the fruit and benefit of them. This is a passage in which Christiana is telling her friends how her husband's journey, Christian's journey, had inspired and paved the way for her and her family to follow um, just a little bit after. And she's essentially saying that if Christian hadn't gone before and, and been the example, then they surely would not have followed. Again, when they meet a character called Mr. Honest, uh, this point is also made. And Bunyan writes, I have heard much of your husband and of his travels and wars which he underwent in his days. So Christian's tale is very famous. Be it spoken to your comfort, the name of your husband rings all over these parts of the world. His faith, his courage, his enduring, and his sincerity under all had made his name famous. Of course, this sounds just like the saints or all the very virtuous people that we look up to. So the saints and, uh, are people that we can look up to and they inspire people to move toward the faith and closer to God. And it might not necessarily be saints in the terms of the Catholic Church, we also look to people like C.S. Lewis, whose writings inspire many Christians to convert, or at least to grow closer to God, uh, every year. So the seventh takeaway is that a pilgrim's tools ought to be used. What I mean by this is that the things, the, the tools we have at hand, the uh, things that can help us in, in uh, growing closer to God every day should be used, and this is exemplified throughout the uh, text as well. There is, in, in the Enchanted Grounds, which is kind of a, a place where many people fall asleep uh, due to some magic in that area, um, 
which implies that, uh, which is telling you that um, to be Christian and to, to make it through to heaven, you have to be vigilant, you have to stay awake, you can't fall asleep. It's here that the character Greatheart is the heroic leader of the party taking Christiana to heaven. Uh, it's here that he breaks out a light to uh, push away some of the darkness of the clouds that are around. And this, I believe, is pointing toward uh, the use of scripture to uh, combat some of the darkness in the world or, or some of the confusion in, in this part of, the, of their journey. So the light here is representing uh, the words of God in the Bible. There's also Christiana's bottle of spirits, which is given to her by the family living at House Beautiful, which I briefly mentioned. Um, now she uses this to heal uh, one of her children that ate something out of the devil's garden early in the story, and that uh, you'd have to read to get the full story there, but essentially um, she's using uh, a, sp a bottle of spirits, which I believe is pointing toward uh, invoking the Holy Spirit to call on help when uh, it's necessary. And of course, as Christians, we should always keep in mind the Holy Spirit as the third part of the Trinity and equal to the other two. And the Holy Spirit is, of course, always a, a strong part of living a very Christian and virtuous life. But it can also be there to help us when in need, like Christiana when her children were sick. And there's also the armor that Christian picked up when he had to fight uh, the devil, called Apollyon later on, which we'll get to in just a second. So number eight is that evil can be defeated. It's a simple statement of that fact. And this is given explicitly uh, when Christian is fighting the demon, not really demon, it's actually the devil himself, called Apollyon in the story. And this is really the biggest moment for Christian, his biggest test, where he's descended into this valley of shame. Um, and at the bottom there's Apollyon, who he is almost defeated by, but by the grace of God he defeats. And with the help of, of Evangelist, who is Jesus, he defeats the devil and uh, passes on. Also throughout, as I mentioned, the giants represent many of the big evils in the world. There are several giants called Grim, Maul, Despair, and then there's also uh, Doubting Castle. And these are all defeated at some point, or at least escaped, by all the Christians who make it to uh, the Celestial City. And then there is, in, in Christiana's second part of the Pilgrim's Progress, there is the tale of the Great Monster, which resembles uh, some of the imagery you would see from Revelations in the descriptions uh, from Bunyan. And even he is not completely defeated, but wounded by uh, the band of, uh, of heroes tagging along with Christiana and Mercy on their journey to heaven. This monster had terrorized Vanity Fair, the evil town, but nonetheless they came to the rescue and defeated him, at least temporarily, until, of course, Evangelist, who is Jesus, would defeat him in the end of times. And number nine, and lastly on this list, which I compiled is that the Lord simply helps us in our journey. In the story, there are several mentions of Evangelist, but there's also a mention of the Shining One, who I believe is an Evangelist, or at least an angel. Cuts down Christiana and her friends after they were, they were trapped by this person called Flatter, who had led them astray of the path uh, just before they reached the Celestial City. So the Shining One, who is Jesus here, had uh, help them out in their moment of need. And then early in the tale, as I mentioned, uh, Evangelist helps Christian defeat Apollyon in his, in his biggest moment of need. When he was about to face defeat, uh, Jesus was there to help him through. So that's it for my top nine takeaways from reading The Pilgrim's Progress and how it kind of impacts uh, our lives and how we can think of it in terms of our lives and our Christian journey toward heaven. I hope you found that an interesting list and I encourage all of you to read the book if you get the chance. It's uh, quite an interesting read, not only for the historical kind of background there and the style of it, but also for the uh, content on a Christian's journey. Also wrote this in article form on my website, www.thinkingwest.com. Be sure to check that out. I'll put it in the description below. And make sure to subscribe and like this video if you found it interesting and if you want to see more, of course. I'll be doing much, many more videos like this on these types of subjects as I uh, read through. So, uh, see you next time. Shh.